How's everybody doing? <laughs> okay, first of all, I want to just say I feel so good being here. And the open hearts and the open minds in the room, I, can, I, I feel it. So thank you guys for having me. So today we're going to talk about racism and how, what we can be doing to have those conversations with our companies, with our friends, with our families. And one of the things that I thought about, like how to kick this off, was a quote from Audre Lorde. She said, it's not our differences that divide us. It's our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. So I want us to start the discussion with that thought in mind and realize that the beauty of America, and as somebody said, the beauty of Atlanta, is that we have all of this diversity. Let's embrace it. So we're gonna start with, with my, my co counterparts here, and I want you guys to introduce yourselves briefly. Yeah, my name is Phil Polk, and I serve as the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Leader for the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. Shameless plug, if you don't, haven't heard of us, we're right on the other side of Centennial Olympic Park. We share space with the Georgia Aquarium and the Coca-Cola, uh, World of Coca-Cola. Would love to see you there, but my primary job and responsibility is to go and help organizations understand DEI concepts, more importantly, how to bring those concepts to life in the context of their organizations. I'll leave it there because I know we're going to be talking for a while. All right, Doe. Uh, so my name is Dove Wilker. I'm uh, the Southeast Regional Director for American Jewish Committee, and I'm also AJC's National Director for Black Jewish Relations. And we, I, I think I'm here for a few reasons, but one of which is we create lots of opportunities to bring the Jewish community together with the non-Jewish com community. So with ethnic and religious partners in particular. And the, you know, I, I love the quote that you started with because that's really the essence of, of part of the work that we do. Um, and the other part of the work that we do is about raising awareness about anti-Semitism, uh, which especially at this time, it, it, I couldn't be more grateful to be here with all of you uh, because of that. We're glad to have you. So one of the things I want to point out as we go into this conversation is there's a difference between being a non-racist and being an anti-racist. Because I notice in a lot of these conversations, people are really quick to say, I'm not a racist. And I want to say, you can be non-racist if you're that person who's open-minded, never going to say a bad thing or treat people differently because of their color or, or religion, culture, whatever. But you become an anti-racist when you're that person who speaks up when you see an injustice. And it's, it's an important differential because I want to challenge all of you to get on the road to becoming anti-racist. And with that in mind, Phil, what role should leadership and management play in championing anti-racist policies within their organizations? So thank you for starting me with that question. Um, quite frankly, I think there's a few different roles that leaders not only should play, but quite frankly are expected to play. And the first of those I would say is modeling the behavior that you seek. So if you want your organization to have these policies in place to ensure kind of fair treatment and, and equal opportunities for success, I think you have to start by modeling that. So when you have an open position, for instance, as a leader, you should be asking the question, let me see the job description. What does the job description call for? And who are we looking for? Where are we trying to source this talent? And if you're asking those questions, you signal to the rest of the organization that this is something that is important to you. It's one thing to have a policy. 
It's another thing to advocate for that policy. Because I think everybody in this room knows that organizations have some policies that aren't enforced. And everybody knows what those are. Uh, dress code, for instance. You may have a dress code policy, but you every day see people coming into the office that don't adhere to that policy. More importantly, nothing happens to them. So if you have anti-racist policies, but there's no teeth, then people aren't going to pay attention to them and you're going to start going backwards. And so I just want to make sure that our leaders know you have to model the behavior that you seek. The other is to be an advocate to the point that was just made. If you're in a circle of people who know you and somebody cracks a joke that is inappropriate, it's not enough for you simply to not laugh. The expectation is that not only do you not laugh, but you speak up again, hey, that's not cool. That, or whatever your business terminology is that would fit that, that term. But I think not only do you just not engage, you also don't allow things to happen that are not within the keeping of the values that your company is supposed to have. Dove, is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, ditto. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 especially on the attire front. Um, no, no, I, I think... In, I think the actions and the voice that we use is very important. And as we think about that from the corporate perspective, I, th I think it's always important to remember that you have people in your communities, in your corporations, who can help guide you, right? I was speaking to someone recently in Atlanta because of a statement that they put out related to what's going on in Israel. And I said to them, well, did you ask a Jewish person for their perspective? And they said, no. And I said, well, did you ask some, but then they said to me, well, but I didn't have an Asian person in the room when we put out our uh, statement against Asian hate and, that, and we were, had a good statement. And I looked at them and said, well, that was a mistake too. <laughs> so it's not, it's not, it's good, it's important to make statements, but it's also important to include those voices in sort of how you're crafting, how you're delivering those messages. Because if you're doing it on an island, then you will make mistakes. And, and I think we can all agree that we don't want to make mistakes, we want to make progress. Thank you for that. Um, Dove, how do we strike a balance between addressing his, I guess, I, I want to say historical injustices, mm -hmm and promoting inclusion and anti-racist policy? As we think about how we engage within our own communities, right? And I'm gonna say the corporations are communities, right? You have communities of people, they've, whether they're local or they're statewide. Um, I, I think it's always important to recognize sort of where we came from, right? The Jewish experience is very much of one of considering our history. We consider our history in everything that we do in Judaism, whether it's a religious history or it's a cultural history. Every single Jewish holiday is based off of something that happened to us previously. So from the Jewish perspective, it's actually very easy for us to think about that. But I understand that that is a religious uniqueness that we, that we have. So I, I think that we need to take that and then use that as a guiding light for how we make decisions as we move forward. Right? We can't limit ourselves by what we have done previously, but we can acknowledge what we have done and what we have said or how we have behaved and do our, make our best efforts to ensure that we are not making them again. I agree 100%. Um, and I think for me, and I'm gonna come to you, Phil, on this, um, as an African-American, one of the things that we have faced for 400 years, but even today, it's, even, it's, it's ramping up a lot where people don't want to hear about our history. Mm -hmm. People don't want to know where we've been. And I think it's important for us to know that we can't know where we're going if we haven't learned where we've been. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things we do at J.E. Dunn a lot after we do anything is, let's talk about do again, do betters. Mm -hmm. You can't do better if you don't recognize the errors that you made. And so, Phil, from your perspective, what lessons should we be thinking about and how do we take those lessons 
to create policies that impact change? The, the, <clears throat> the first thing I'll say is, a, is kind of a, a ditto for both of you. Those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it first. Uh, secondly, I think that dialogue is absolutely critical at this point. Because quite frankly, we are all in our feelings about something. There's something happening to every community in Atlanta, every community in this country. Oftentimes, though, we don't talk about it. And we don't talk about it because we feel like other folks don't want to hear. As far as I'm concerned, I can't think of an uncomfortable topic in any corporation where folks go to work saying, I want to talk about how I missed my budget. I want to talk about how I missed my forecast. I mean, uncomfortable conversations are a reality for all of us. That does not mean that we don't engage. And so I think that it's time for us now in a room of diverse individuals, and that's not just race. That's religion, that's orientation, that's ability level. I think we need to talk about the things that are making it difficult for us to maximize the potential of our organization. Because if we're fractured, if we're divided, because there's something that I feel that is uncomfortable about myself and about Dove, then we're not going to achieve our potential. In an organization, that's the reason you're at work. You're at work to maximize your potential. And if something is holding you back from that, you need to address it and overcome it. And sometimes that means having tough conversations, but as long as they're structured, as long as you have rules for how to engage, I think that it's possible for all of us in our organizations to overcome whatever's happening. Even if it means me getting 10 minutes to say, here's why I'm at work upset today, mm. because this happened to me, or because I have this perceived issue with a coworker. Oftentimes you'll find that the issues are not as big as you make them out to be, and even if they are, there's even more reason that you need to talk. So I think it starts with talking and discussing the issues, then collectively determining what are some of the policies we need to implement or what are some of the policies we need to remove. Because there are archived policies that are holding us back that many times we don't even recognize because they don't impact us. But they may impact coworkers, and you should feel as strongly about removing the barriers for them as they should feel about removing them for you. Um, okay, I just want to add. That. Go ahead. I, I, I agree with you 100%. And the, the, the comment on policies that we don't think about often I, is, is really incredible. To, I'm so glad that you brought that up. I, I do want to add one example, though. You know, right now we are witnessing a, an absurd rise of, of hate, of anti Semitism, and of Islamophobia. Right? It is at historic levels. And as we were discussing right before we came up here, you don't always need to bring people together to discuss the challenges that they are facing, right? It's okay, and actually I would say at this moment, I know for the Jewish community, and I, and I would never speak on behalf of the Muslim community, but I do believe in this instance they would agree, it's important to bring those groups within your, within your communities together individually, right? Don't feel the need to bring the Jews and Jewish and Muslim team members together. It's okay to listen to groups individually. And I think almost, it's probably the best place to start is by starting with the individual group and then discussing how you can go beyond that. But that's an awareness of the challenges that we might be facing. 100% agree there too. <laughs> okay guys, so you can decide who answers this one. How do we address potential pushback or resistance to anti-racist policies within institutions or society at large? And how do we ensure that anti-racist policies are actually implemented? And then the crucial piece for me, followed up and and with with consequences if they are not implemented properly or enforced. All right, so let me start with an acknowledgement. We don't have enough time to go, <laughs> to, to go, to go through that. But I did write some notes because there's a lot I want to say and I don't want to miss anything. So I may not get to each of the three points that you've talked about, but let me start with the first one. How do we address potential pushback? Um, first, let me acknowledge in my line of work, I recognize four different types of racism, right? There's interpersonal, there's internalized, there's structural, and there's institutional. 
So what, what I'm talking about now is institutional racism because that, there's different strategies for the different kinds that you kind of have to address. And first, to me, is um, I think companies need to really explain the policies that they have or that they are looking to implement. Because to me, what we're talking about really is change management. And change management is way more than words on a paper. Change management is about changing the way people act. And if you have longer tenured employees, it's even more difficult. Because they remember back in the day, we used to do it this way. So why do I now have to change? And you got to address that, right? I know back in the day, we used to come to work and use phrases that are now inappropriate. How many people are aware of alphabet soup? I don't really know anything about the LGBTQ community. Why should I have to know? Well, you got to know because those people work with you and we need equal treatment for all the policies that you got to you got to walk people through that. So first is explaining the rationale for the policies that you do have so that people know that they are real and that there's a reason behind them. Uh, second, and in, in no particular order, to I think your last point about how do you make sure that these policies are enforced, to me that's about governance. Do you have metrics? Do you have ways to check in on whether or not these policies are being either um, enforced or they're being broken, that's where ERGs, BRGs, diversity councils, whatever you want to call them, that's where those things come in. Hey, is everything working for you the way that it should work? Are things working for you the way that they work for your coworkers? Because leaders won't be able to answer all these questions, but what you should have are advocates or boots on the ground, as they say, to kind of help you know what's working or what's not working with the policies that you have. Um, another critical piece is organizational alignment. Leaders are influencers. What leaders do, people notice and follow. You, 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 many organizations and many employees in organizations determine what's most important by what the leaders do. So you may have a book of 15 policies, but if you see the leaders going in on three or four of those policies, that's what you're going to pay attention to. And so it's critical that leaders in organizations know this is one we can't let slip. Because there's a difference between a policy or something that is in your company's DNA and something that is called an initiative. And I, don't, I do not agree with the word initiative being used to describe DE&I work, right? I think DE&I work now has undergone a transition from being a moral imperative to being a business imperative. I think that's something they talked about Say on that, that, twice. That, that supplier diversity panel. Business imperative means it is a non-negotiable. If this is something you don't want to do, Figure that out on the weekend. But when you're at work, this is how we expect you to behave or you leave. Right? That, that's, I think that's how it should be. Now, thank you, thank you for the, the validation. Uh, the reality, though, because I do d &I training for a living, the reality is here's a conversation that I may have with a client. We have a diversity thing coming up. We're expecting 50 people. We'll see who shows up. That means it's not mandatory. And in many of the organizations I deal with, that's the level of treatment that DE&I gets. You go if you can go. But if you can't go, we understand. Well, we don't say that about the town hall when the CEO is speaking. We don't say that about the things that the company deems to be critically important. So it must not be critically important. I know it's a policy. I know you have it written down. But if your walk doesn't equal your talk, then what are we really talking about? So, so I really think that governance piece is critical. And I know for many folks, you know, some people have incentives tied to doing de and work, others don't. But the question for organizations that I think is critically important to answer is, do your policies have any teeth? What happens when somebody doesn't do it? And that is an organizational specific answer. All I know is what measures, what gets measured gets done. And if you don't have any teeth in your policy, do not expect people to follow it unless they want to. And I don't know any corporation with a business forecast to hit that is tolerant of folks that say, I don't want to do that. If you think that it is something that is critical to your organization's longevity and success. And I do believe de and is critical to organizations' success. So if it's, if it's critical to your success, act like it's critical to your success. Thank you. <laughs> He can drop the mic now, right? right. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> Go on, though. I want to add a, a, a few uh, ideas as well. Um, I, I'm a huge believer in professional development. It is something that I preach in my office and to my organization, and we're a global organization. 
one of the ways to engage is to create new opportunities, especially for lower level employees, right? And as, as we frame those opportunities as in a special way, right? Yes, it's gonna create more work for them, but get their buy-in and get their leadership, right? Not everything has to be done top down, right? Things can be, help, can be moved at, with your evangelists at, who are at a lower level at a younger generation, newer employees, right? I think we often for, feel that everything has to be top down, but especially in, with these changes, it's bottom up. It can be bottom up. Number two, to the metric standpoint, on my own internal dashboard that we review weekly, and I run a Jewish organization, one of our metrics is about Jewish diversity, right? Because being Jewish does not mean white. And being black does not mean Christian, right? In fact, 50% of the Muslims in the metro Atlanta area are African American, right? Probably about 10% of the Jewish community are considered Jews of color. So when you think about these DEI practices, it, it has to be expanded to include religion. It has to be include, expanded to include um, different nationalities. Because as, if we limit it, I will tell you that there, much of the conversation in the Jewish community is actually how we are not included in the DEI conversations. And it is very frustrating and painful because we are experiencing a, a level of anti-Semitism that we have not seen. And the anxiety, I was speaking to a, a, a global company yesterday and one of the employees said to me, my productivity has dropped significantly because of what I've been experiencing, the pain that I have felt over the past three weeks. How do I speak to my leader about that? And I said to them, because the pain has been so great for me, I said, it's about acknowledgement, right? It's recognizing that people are going through different periods in their lives and that what goes on around the world does have an impact on our own employees and team members and therefore directly with our communities. 100%. I do have two other things to say that is, I'm glad I wrote them down. First, to the point that Dove just made, is be consistent. So if you're talking about policies that are meant to support everyone in the organization, make sure they support everyone in the organization. You have some organizations or some, some uh, groups of employees that receive more attention than others, and it may be because of the size, but in the words of Dr. King, um, injustice anywhere mm -hmm. is a threat to justice everywhere. So you have to make sure that you apply consistent application of your policies to all of your employees. The last thing I will say, be informed. Uh, we had a, an LGBTQ business forum a couple of weeks ago, and one of the stats that was introduced just blew my mind. I think it may have been so far this year, there have been four to 500 uh, pieces of legislation proposed that were anti-LGBTQ. Wow. That number absolutely blew my mind because I'm not that close to that community. I can tell you about the communities that I'm in and some of the threats there, but you gotta stay informed because your employees, if you write a policy, they expect you to know when that policy is threatened. And so your job is to be informed because there's legislation, civil rights legislation didn't end in the 60s. And we need to know that there's a threat and there's a fight about this stuff every day. And we need to be informed across all areas of whatever policies we have. And you're right, it affects all of us. And I wanna say thank you to all of the allies in the room and I'm going to encourage all of you um, to, to think about the things that were said here and know that in order for change to happen, we all have to be a part of it. Yeah. No matter what our race, what our background, we're one people. And we need to all embrace and celebrate those differences. Thank you both. Wait, wait. Uh, okay. I, see we have really seconds. Quick. I want you to have the final seconds. word, but I want to add this. It's very important to me. Um, if you have Jewish friends, if you have Muslim friends, if you've got Jewish and Muslim employees, please reach out to them. Just check in, send a text message, send an email. Not everything has to be done company wide. No, that's 100%. Right? True. And so take those moments to check in with your, especially in those communities today because I guarantee you that they are reeling in a way that you, if you, if you haven't seen it, it is very internalized. Now you if get your you final word. If you see something, say something. 
don't just sit and listen if you hear somebody say something that's hurtful or could be perceived as hurtful. But thank you, everybody. I'm walking off before they pull us off with the cane. <laughs>